It's been uh, about a year since we had the privilege of of having Phil down here, and unfortunately, the first time we had you in the, the studio, we were slammed with podcasting, and you came down, at least graced us with your presence, did some great content for our YouTube channel, and have been meaning to get you back in the studio so we could chop it up, man, so welcome. <laughs> Yeah, Thank you survived you our bathroom. Me. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, when I first came here, you guys were renovating that motherfucker. <laughs> it was bad. No, it, it was real bad. It looks good in there now. Yeah. It's, it's I'll definitely take a shit in there. Easy. All, all, <laughs> we had, all we had to do was stop paying rent. And then it yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway. Imagine how that motivates people, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you guys, now you guys were talking earlier. I just walked in on a conversation before we turned on the mics. You guys mm-hmm. were talking about the, I guess, the fights that happened. Well, the before weekend. before Phil or before Phil got here, Justin and I were looking at some old clips. Uh, he actually went down the last time he was here. He went down and kind of messed with uh, Logan Paul a little bit. So oh, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We were talking yeah. about the brothers fun. right now. Yeah, yeah. That was fun. That was fun. I'm not gonna lie. I I, I went there not knowing what I was going to get into, right? So the kid has a fucking mansion, by the way. If you guys haven't seen it, mm. I know y'all, the, all the young kids, yeah, fucking Logan Paul, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, I didn't know who he was really. My, oh, you didn't even know who I, he was? I going mean, to- I knew to a degree. Like, right. I wasn't like, my daughters definitely knew. Yeah, they were yeah. fucking excited for that for me, I guess. And I was like, I, I trained multiple world champions, but hey, Logan Paul, <laughs> fun, you know what I'm hey, now that's yeah. gonna be, the cake. Right that's got to be funny as a dad, oh, right? 100%. Like you're around famous people all the time, training these badass athletes yeah. who you have all the respect and work for. You're going down yeah. to go see some YouTuber, yeah. and your little daughters are probably freaking out. Yeah, they were they were they were tripping about it. I was like, all right, <laughs> like oh get. Tell them to follow me on Instagram. I'm like, no. <laughs> what? What are we doing? Oh, yeah. That's status right there. Fuck, fuck Dustin Poirier. We talking about Logan Paul here. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. Okay. So, no, I went there, and uh, we had a mutual – I just knew the coach that, that he was working with. Uh, again, he's trained some of my fighters that I actually mm-hmm. work with now, Sullivan Barrera. Sullivan's actually fighting Kovalev in another month, so getting him ready. Um, but the, the, the style that he – has now is similar to what uh, a boxing coach of mine, Paulie Gloves, that's what we call him, uh, Paul Gavoni. And he kind of mimics this style where if you're a larger or a taller guy, you would have a longer reach per se. So you would do more of the long style, which quote unquote is what they call it. So he went in there and I seen him throwing, hitting the bag and throwing his hands and he's not bad. Like he's a good athlete. Don't get me wrong. Like hundred percent, I think he's wrestled in high school and maybe mm-hmm. in some college and stuff. And mm-hmm. definitely a big guy, too, as well. He's, he's bigger than his brother. He's bigger oh, than yeah. Jake, right? He's taller, right? Yeah. yeah. He's They're both kind of big boys, right? I didn't see Jake, so oh, I don't yeah. know. Okay. But but I know Logan's a big boy, yeah. for sure, 100%. And, uh, and he was taking it serious until he told me one thing and cut our workout short. And he had to go to the fucking Catalina wine mixer. <laughs> what? <laughs> I was like, I was like, is that for real? Dude, that's like, a that, real thing. I was like, yeah, that, I, I thought that was in the movie. Yeah, I thought that was just a spoof. Like, this, uh, rich f- rich people shit. Brothers. Like fucking rich people Catalina. shit. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So and and so yeah, he cut it short, and then I found out that he took his private bus to his private yacht, which then. He had a chopper land on the yacht and take him over to the Catalina wine mixer. This shit, I swear to God, has happened. It's totally <laughs> normal. So I'm like, so you cutting the workout short for this? I'm like, you know what? Yeah. Okay. This is definitely some, some <laughs> Instagram shit right here, bro. YouTube stuff. But wow. to his defense, I would say this: he he did take it serious. Like he was taking the training serious. He was taking what I what I gave him as far as tips for recovery and conditioning. He he took it real serious. So. I give them that. Now, when it comes to the two, watching both of them, Jake and Logan, you know, I think Jake has better skill set. Mm. I think Jake puts his punches a lot, puts it together a lot better. I think he creates more torque, more power, um, turns his punches over a little bit better. But I don't know. I don't know if they're going to fight or anything. Now, like you that. saw the you, – you watched the Roy fight and mm-hmm. Tyson, and he was on that undercard. What did you think of the fights? Um <sighs> – I mean, I love Tyson, man. I grew up watching Tyson. I I mimicked Tyson when I was fighting, you know. So and even Roy too, man. Who must have y'all must have forgot? Like fucking, yeah. I had that had the album. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't have said that. I, <laughs> I was jamming that shit too. Yeah, but but no, I mean, I I, th- I thought that I thought Tyson won the fight for sure. I thought yeah. he edged it over. But, you know, obviously bigger gloves and like shorter time. He had the real time in there. I, obviously, everybody knows Tyson would have won anyways. Mm, you know what yeah. I mean in that per, in that perspective. But as far as Jake goes, 
I mean, it's a fucking basketball player he was fighting. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, why are you going to step in there? And then somebody said it on Twitter. It was like, you don't play boxing. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You 100% yeah. don't do that shit. <laughs> well, this is a good question to ask someone like you who has so much uh, respect for the sports uh, of fighting. Um, you're obviously in it uh, very deep. You're a fighter yourself. How does it feel seeing, you know, YouTube stars and, you know, basketball players bring in – these crowds and generate this revenue and you've and you i'm sure you personally know a hundred boxers that have put in time and energy oh, and yeah, skill definitely. that can't even make you know they yeah. can't rub two quarters together like how's yeah. that how, what is that like i work with some of those guys mm -hmm. you know it's it's tough to watch a guy and a, a kid come from like seven years old and now he's 28 still fighting on undercards and not making shit you know same thing with mma mma is even worse mm. you know but it also is a good thing because you're bringing more people's eyes to the sport. Mm -hmm. Un unfortunately, it's to that. It had to come to that for it to happen. Um, do I feel that they have the ability or they have the the right to call other fighters out? Fuck no. Yeah. Like, know your, know your place. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? In that perspective, like Jake calling out Conor McGregor and Dylan Dennis and I'm, listen, bro, like... There's levels. Yeah. There's definite levels. Please stop. Please stop. Jake, you're, you, can, you can be good, like, for sure. And, you know, you just have to understand that take your time and make the steps in the right direction. Don't. I mean, it's good to have high goals, mm -hmm. but calling them out and disrespecting them makes the sport a mockery. I, I remember learning that lesson firsthand. I remember when I was doing jiu-jitsu, I was training hard. I was competing in local tournaments mm -hmm. in my club. I was good. You know, I was, I was pretty good. I was a purple belt. And then mm -hmm. a world-class uh, Pan Am champion, uh, same, you know, it was a purple belt just like me, um, came and visited from Brazil. So here I am. I won like a local tournament. I'm pretty good at my club. Strong guy. You know, and I see another purple belt. Like, oh, this will be a, a good match. And it was uh, it was like I had stepped into a, a new universe yeah. where I didn't know jiu-jitsu anymore. Yeah. Like I literally went on the mat, and I, it was a very valuable lesson in the, the difference between – World class, and I practice. Well, there's the thing, too, because so. I could totally see how disrespectful that is, but mm -hmm. also there's a part of me that's like, I kind of want him to learn a lesson uh, you know, in front of everybody. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah is, but, he, is he really going to learn a lesson, though, or is it really just a money grab? It's, I, a, money it's grab. a money grab. That's how for I feel. Sure. I mean, I yeah. feel like it's... Uh, yeah, what's the win for Conor McGregor? If he goes in there no, and kicks no, his he ass, has no he gets, win there's no that. win. Yeah, no. there's nothing there for him. I mean, he makes maybe five, but money. a couple million dollars, but yeah. you know, maybe more than that. Tens yeah. of million dollars, but you know, at the end of the day, it's like that's definitely a lose lose. Now, yeah. sure. now, when when other fighters are seeing this, like you said, who put the time and effort, I have all the respect in the world for for well for athletes that do that, but especially fighters because you're, I mean, when you're in the ring, it's a it's a different sport. You're mm -hmm. you're literally fighting, and you you yeah. can get hurt, um, and you put a lot of energy into it, and it, you don't always make a lot of money. When they see stuff like that, are they thinking? Or are they talking to you about how? they can make them, you know, maybe brand themselves so that mm -hmm. they can start to generate money. Because it's obvious that just being good isn't always necessarily enough, right? Mm -hmm. Never enough. Not, not, not at this point. You know, I think that a lot of the fighters now, especially in the UFC, are beginning to see that based off of what Connor has kind of laid out mm -hmm. as far right. as the blueprint goes. And so, yeah, people are starting to call people out a little bit more. And it's not, it's not that it hasn't been done before, but you can see the level has gone up a bit. Um, marketing themselves, doing things on social media, doing things around their area. I think Dustin does a great job of that, but he does it in a positive way, mm -hmm. right? He, he does a lot for charity. Obviously he has his own foundation. So with that, he kind of puts himself in this light of I'm the good guy, you know, and, and trust me, he is a good guy, like honestly, but he's being able to market himself in a positive manner that is going to help attract people to buy his fights on top of the fact that he can fight his ass off. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's ways that you can go about doing it in a positive way without making yourself look like an asshole. Now as a spectator, are, are we only getting to see then, um, you know, above average at best fighters fight because you have people like the Connor. Like I've heard people make the argument that Connor's not even a great fighter. I mean, for mm -hmm. me as a spectator, no, he looks amazing. No. But I've definitely heard, a great fighter. Okay, sure, yeah. okay. So you know, there's some people that make that case that Dana mm -hmm. set him up with all the fights and that no. it, he had easy street. You'll see. 
It's okay. the UFC. Like, honestly, if you don't, anybody who makes it to the UFC is skillful. Yeah. So to the average person, yeah, you, whoever's saying that is going to get their ass kicked by Conor McGregor if he ever walks <laughs> yeah. around the street. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's That's not it. I mean, you got to think matchups, you know, and if I guess, yes, he had great matchups if you want to call it that, but he was just fighting up his ranks. Yeah. And at the end of the day, you can't say that he didn't get two belts out of it mm-hmm. in two different weight classes. Now, yeah. I'm going to follow up along with what Adam just said, um, and I'm going to pose the question differently. Could you be a really good fighter, but not be exciting to watch, be kind of boring, not marketable, and then just not get picked up by the UFC? Oh, yeah. All the time. There's mm-hmm. a lot of guys mm-hmm. in regional scenes or that kind of make it to the UFC, maybe drop one or had a bad showing. And then they, you never hear from them again, mm. right? Great jujitsu guys, guys that grind, you know, wrestling style, you know what I mean? And not be able to finish, but just edge out or at least dominate on the floor, but not be as exciting, like not knock out power. They're not, you know, they don't have that, that ability to draw a crowd, you know, things of that nature. And yeah, you'll, you probably never hear from them again. They'll what's probably that, become coaches. What's that mm-hmm. typical journey look like for a fighter, right? So, you know, you're, you'd say you're winning in regionals, you get a shot. And does, mm-hmm. doesn't UFC only normally give you like a fight or a five fight type of con- – how does that work? Like, it depends on the person. It depends on how much they're bringing to the table. Okay, so yeah. give me like standard, like a normal like journeyman, not somebody mm-hmm. who is like, like, oh my God, everybody's talking about his fights in regionals. Like a, <clears> just a good fighter who's winning who gets a shot. Like, Yeah, well, it used to be you would get your shot on the ultimate fighter. And that was really where they started to develop those mm. guys. And you would have to go there and audition. And then they would have to see exactly, are you marketable? Are you going to draw the crowd? Because that would be based off of your interview. Mm. So you would have like a three-part series of interviews. And then you would also do a tryout as okay. well to see how physically good you are skill-wise, you know, knowing the techniques and things of that nature. And then also have the ability to sell yourself. So would you say that the the show, because I like Ultimate Fighter, it's mm-hmm. one of my favorite shows to watch, would you say that it's a pretty good collection of some pretty badass guys that make it 100%. to the... Okay. Look, at, look at the guys that came out of it. I know, right? There's Most a lot of... Most of them are world champions. Right, mm-hmm. right. For sure. At, and, and they're coming back with another series, another uh, season. And I think that this one is going to be really good based on, I think the coaches, I think the coach may be Habib. I'm not sure. I'm not, don't let me speak out of turn, but mm. I believe that's what they're trying to do. Mm. So wow. we'll see. What, okay, so let me ask you this then. What are the attributes that would make someone a great fighter? And then what are the additional attributes that they would need to become a successful fighter? I'm talking about in terms of Everything, huh? money and business and that mm. kind of stuff. So I'm sure that there are probably yeah. lots of commonalities, but yeah. in order to become successful versus just being a good fighter, a great fighter. Yeah, you have to have that star quality. Um, So the goal really first and foremost is you have to have the technical and tactical efficiency. So you have to be able to produce wins and doing in a great fashion. So learning the techniques is first and foremost, right? Learning how to skillfully put it together from a strategy standpoint and then putting it together from a tactical standpoint Mm. and then also being able to carry that over inside the fight. A lot of guys are really good in the gym, but when the fight comes, they close that cage door and they crumble. Bro, I mm. had such trouble with tournaments because of that because mm-hmm. I would get so so amped up that I would yeah. exhaust myself. But in the club, I was just no problem. Yeah, because yeah. you were you were confident. Yes, you were mm-hmm. confident. You didn't have that 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 level of uncertainty, mm. right? Um, I believe that those types of fighters rise to the occasion. Mm-hmm. You know, so that anxiety isn't there, and if somebody can overcome the anxiety and still produce what they've done inside the training right, that's room. Huge. Mm-hmm. That's how they get it done. And, and the, the guys that are really good at that and the girls, don't even get me wrong. You got a lot of those too, as well is the ones that can just focus in on the task, not worry about all the other outside things going on. And so for that, that makes them elite. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you, do you gamble on the fights at all? Me? Yeah. No, don't get me in trouble. I'm, okay. <laughs> okay. So are you not supposed to gamble in the fights? Is that? Oh, no, no, no. I mean, shit. I mean, I, I got to th- Okay. I'm pretty good at, and I'm nowhere near at the understanding and the level you are, but I'm pretty good at picking right. UFC fights. I would imagine a coach like you, yeah, you have some insight. So, would know styles and yeah. fighters so well, you could bet I mean, pretty well. I, I'm, not a, I'm not much of a gambler, though. Like, oh, I like fuck. I like to be, I like to have my hands on everything. Like, if, if I'm not, like, if I'm not in it, if I don't have, like, I'll bet on my guys for sure. Okay. I know, I know I've, I've had a hand in it in some way. Oh, I see. You ever right? bet against your guys? 
Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be the worst coaching. I do, I do. You ain't going to give the name up, bro. You ain't going to give the name up right now, bro. No, I've, I've been in places where I was like, fuck, man, I think he's going to lose, but I hope he wins. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Or, yeah. or she or something okay, like okay. that. I've been in those, like, because it's a hard fight and it's the UFC or it's, 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 it's you know, it's world champion boxing, you know. Well, and you've spent every day leading right. up to that with them, so you got to know yeah. their mindset going it's, in. It's more of a mindset thing. It's yeah. not, yeah. it has nothing really to do with the physical capabilities because everybody has those mm -hmm. if you're at that level like all I, man getting dustin ready for connor like yeah. bro, all i gotta make sure he is ready is is he's mentally prepared yeah. and he has the ability to manage his fatigue that's really what it is are there mm -hmm. are there signs then okay so when you're because you've prepared so many fighters so when you're preparing a fighter are there signs when you like you like man this he's he's got he's them dialed in. yeah he's yeah. down yeah but then i have times where i'm like yo he's fucking ready and then they shit the bed I'm oh, like, wow. wow, what the fuck just happened? You really? know, but yeah. it's because of the fact that the fight was too much, hmm. right? It was really good, you know, leading up. Everything was on point. All the numbers were going up. And then all of a sudden you're like, it just unfolded in the wrong way. You're wow. like, oh, wow. It's such a, it makes such a huge impact. Like I said, I, I experienced that uh, personally where you just, you're going into the competition crushing it never getting tired mm -hmm. and because you worked yourself up so much and people are watching and there's so much pressure well i've heard some get exhausted. Sports, sports psychologists will take them down and sort of recreate that where they'll walk in and then they'll yep. imagine themselves yep. like having the crowd uh, there and then performing and like yep. do you do that within your athletes yeah so like i mean the skills guys would do that more so but yeah. i would put them in the direct bioenergetic demands of what's going to happen like from a from a time perspective or duration mm -hmm. right because that's that's sports specificity from a physical preparation mm -hmm. standpoint um, but when I was fighting Dean Thomas used to put us in the cage that we had a little mini cage and then he would call all like the parents and the people that joined oh, the gym right. and they would come out and it'd be the Saturday before the fight and that Saturday night was like a mock fight uh, Okay. so like you would have That's multiple smart. multiple sparring partners so you'd get it's dog in a hole or shark tank or whatever mm -hmm. and you would be in there for you know your three by fives or whatever or five by threes and then people would fucking boo the shit out of you like mm. they would call you names cuss uh, you out yeah or he would do shit like put classical music or some shit that we didn't want to hear in sparring where we were like man this is totally throwing Throws us you off, off. Okay. Oh, okay. so like we didn't like the sound if it was some Interesting. it was a like if he, he knew who we were because we had when he was training me and myself with like five other of his pros that he brought up if you guys don't know who dean thomas is he's like a ufc veteran mm -hmm. um he's he does uh, uh dana white looking for a fight okay mm -hmm. he's a black guy in there okay. he's the only black dude in there <laughs> <laughs> so, right. so but dean was my coach uh since i was like 19 years old he was actually on my podcast too we talk a little bit about like the history of how we met and stuff but but he would he would throw that on and we would have five guys that were pros and we would train together and we would throw, he would throw on this music and we'd be like, man, the fuck, man this fucking guy throwing this gay shit on. <laughs> like, come on, man. So, yeah, I mean, so it was like that and then that kind of got us ready for the, ne the negative things that we were going to have to deal with inside the fight and we always fought, like I've, especially with me, I've always fought in other people's territory. Mm. Like it was always either in Louisiana or North Carolina or like somewhere in the backwoods of fucking Alabama. It's crazy shit when I was, you know, growing up into the sport. And then like I used to fight for like two hundred dollars, man. Like mm. it wasn't any money in this shit whatsoever. I actually spent money going back home. I actually lost money going back home. But those times got me to develop my mindset and then got me to understand how these fighters and what these fighters go through on yeah. a on a in camp and in the fight itself. When did you when did you realize that you had as much or more passion for teaching others how to fight than actually fighting yourself? I think it was um I mean, I was doing this while I was fighting. So I was actually coaching while I was fighting too as well. And I was doing that with my teammates because we had, again, that small group. So we had a group of people that we had to rely upon because Dean wasn't always there. Dean would have to go, you know, train Tyron Woodley. He would leave for like six to seven months sometimes and be gone. So we would have to train each other. So I took it upon myself as, as a captain 
to get everybody together and I would run training practices and, and things of that nature. So that's how it kind of developed. And then from, you know, once I decided to retire, then it was just an easy transition. Mm -hmm. And now it, what kind of a person, because for the average person looking in and they're hearing most fighters don't make a lot of money, mm -hmm. you're going to get hurt. That's part of the, part yeah. of the sport yeah. you're fighting. Uh, most people don't want to fight. Yeah. What kind of a person wants to do that? In other mm -hmm. words, what, what are the characteristics that make? Because I know the kind of person that gets into fitness, they tend mm -hmm. to be insecure about their body, so they start working out. Maybe they become empowered. Now they become, fall in love with it, and then they want to train other people. What kind of people want to be fighters? What makes somebody want to be want to do that? There's many different fighters out there. Right? Oh, really? There's different okay. categories of fighters, and, and Dean talks a lot about this. There's like the fighter, which is a guy that just – Loves to fight. Yeah, yeah, that's that's like Diaz brothers. Yeah, Diaz brothers. Yes, for sure. Dustin is one of those guys. You know, then you have the martial artist, right? That's like GSP, mm -hmm. or like an Anderson mm -hmm. Silva. Loves the art, yeah. right? They love to. They love the art of martial art, and they test themselves in the fight. Mm. Then you have the athlete. That's the guy like Tyron Woodley who came from a different sport, sporting background, or was a football player and then transitioned over. And that was kind of me right there. That because I played college football, and I was like, man, I. I like to fight because I like to challenge myself and what better way to challenge yourself one-on-one -on -one with an individual and be so primal as to step in a cage and fight somebody. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and then you have, you know, the competitor, which is a guy that just wants to compete, whatever it is. It could be anything. It could be chess, checkers, whatever. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So you have those guys and then you have a mix. You have hybrids. I was just going to say, how often do you see somebody who has kind of a blend of all of it? And is yeah. that the ultimate fighter for you? I think so, man. I think you can turn it on and turn it off at, at certain ways in, in times of the fight. You know, mm -hmm. I think you should be a martial artist in times and I think you should be a true fighter at times. You know, I think you need to know when to turn it up. I think you need to know how to be respectful, you know, and that's really where you'll get the elite. But, you know, um, which, what uh, well, which, which one of the, <laughs> which one of those is the, are, are the easiest to coach? Mm. Uh, I mean, from what you're saying, it sounds like, uh, it, with the mindset and stuff, it might be easiest to coach a fighter because they love fighting so much. It doesn't matter. Um, but, it, yeah. but am I wrong? I mean, no, I think, I think that also has to deal with personality types too, as well. Like okay. a dopamine driven individual is going to be like a raw, like he just wants to get after it. And you got a guy that's really acetylcholine dominant. who's really like analytical. You know, that's that's kind of the I like a mix of both. I like a maybe a acetylcholine dopamine dominant type of individual, mm -hmm. somebody who's willing to get after it once they understand what they're doing, likes to ask questions because they want to know what's working and why it is working, mm -hmm. but also is ready to turn that switch on. And that's that's where you'll get a fighter that is going to take it to the top. How, sure. how often are you surprised? How often do you assess somebody and you, you feel like, you, oh, he's going to be like this and then like they get in there and you're like, oh shit. Yeah, are when's you, the are, last time you watched a fight and you, oh, man, and you were just, what's the biggest surprise where you're like, I can't believe good that person bad. just won. Yeah, yeah, yeah good, good, or bad. good or bad. I'll tell you one that was fucking amazing to me. I was like, I was uh, cornering one of my guys, actually one of my teammates um, in like 2011 and we were in this, we were in a, Atlanta, Georgia, was in Atlanta, somewhere in Georgia. And uh, it was a shithole, like 100%. But the guys fighting there were all regional scene guys. And we were in the back and the, the warm-up room was like a kitchen. <laughs> this was like in a bar somewhere, <laughs> right? So I'm, I'm back there and I'm warming up my guy and we're wrapping him up. And then I see this guy in the corner of my eye and he's fucking like hitting, hitting pads and doing shadow and shadow boxing the most the weirdest fucking way I've ever seen. And it looked like he didn't know what he was doing, like what he was doing, like swatting flies almost. Right. Hmm. So he goes out to the fight and like, I'm, I didn't watch the fight, but I heard it. And, and all you heard was like the bell rang and you heard, Oh, and everybody starts. I'm like, Oh shit. The kid got knocked out. He comes back and he's got a fucking metal on his. He's like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? How'd this happen? So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's Mr. Looks like must have trained him. In, in a way, man. <laughs> I think also like you could also look really good shadow boxing and hitting pads, but when it comes to fighting an individual, you, you can't totally different, right? Yeah. Yeah. How, how important is the ability to be able to take a punch and how the hell oh, do you yeah. train that? Or can you train that? I think some of that you have to be born with for sure to be able to take a punch and, and keep going. Um, just have a thick skull. Yeah. <laughs> Big head like Justin. Yeah, some people. It just, helps. Yeah. But then some people are really prone to getting knocked out, you know, and, and, and then you have, 
certain things that happen throughout your life, like any type of head trauma is obviously going to deteriorate your ability to take a punch, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to weaken the chin per se, what people say, you know? So what does that look like in the training process? Because I know like back in the day, old school, like they would have a lot more, uh, you know, like fights where it was like full contact uh, mm -hmm. in the training sessions versus like backing off of yeah. that to, to try and like save them for the fight. Well, if you look at it like, um, like Vanderlei Silva and those guys that have wars in the gym, their careers kind of deteriorated through our eyes, you know, mm -hmm. and um, a guy like Robbie Lawler stopped doing that years ago. Mm -hmm. Like he was like, I remember... You know, he went to American Top Team and he stopped sparring for a good amount of time. Like, I want to say his last maybe seven or eight fights, he stopped sparring for his camps. Um, and that's helped him out because, again, you don't want to put yourself in that position to, like, get, you know, accumulate damage while you're trying to get better. Mm -hmm. You know, in that way, you save that for the fight. It's the same thing when somebody goes for, like, a powerlifting meet. Like you don't want to always hit your one rep max leading up into the competition. Mm -hmm. Like you want to build up to that, and then once the once the time comes for you to put it all out there, then you do it. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, but how do you balance that with also teaching? I'm sure this is probably more important for people who are newer to the fight game. You know, balance that out with also learning how to take a punch and learning how to yeah. fight through that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's definitely that's one of the things that you have to get time in the gym you have to spar you have to get hit but you have to learn how to you know roll with it in a sense you know roll with the punches they say but mm -hmm. you have to be able to do that because again once you get hit for real your mind kind of changes like things shift like if i Every, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face right? yeah. that's, a, that's, that's a, great a great quote, quote. like yeah. honestly and you see it in people's eyes, like in sparring and a new kid will come into the gym and, and he'll get hit for the first time and he's like, oh shit. And then you'll find out, <laughs> you'll find out if he's going to stay or not because he might not show up the next day. You yeah. you mentioned uh, American Top Team. So what, what makes a badass team? Is it the coaches? Is it the actual athletes that are mm -hmm. part of it? Is it a blend of two? Like what, what makes a badass team? I mean, you got a lot of great teams out there for sure. Right, right. You know, I think that a mix of understanding between the coaches, not trying to be the guy, um, always being able to put in terms of the fighter is the main priority. Yeah. And then also training partners, like training partners make or break a gym. Yeah. You know, you have to be, you have to have cohesiveness. They have to be able to want to hang out with each other outside of the gym. There has to be almost like a family bond in a sense yeah. because you need each other. Even though it's an individualized sport, you still need training partners and those training partners you need to rely upon and they need to rely upon you. So with that, I think a large amount comes from having the ability to have iron sharpen iron. Mm. I, I imagine it's got to be challenging because of the, the amount of egos. I mean, mm -hmm. nobody, I mean, or at least I would think uh, very few guys and girls walking into that environment are weak minded mm -hmm. or soft or no. don't think of themselves as a badass and a leader. So, mm -hmm. how often as coaches are you guys having to like kind of pull back the reins on these guys and do they fight each other a lot and get pissed off? Like, what, what's that dynamic like? I mean, I've seen a couple of fights in the gym for sure. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> the, the thing about MMA is that it's a little bit it's more about com camaraderie in a sense. Like, mm. yeah, we fight each other. We shake hands afterwards and we leave it in the gym. We never take it outside the gym. And if that does happen, then that guy isn't meant for the team. He's not meant and to be. Does that happen? That does that happen where you guys got to say, you know, yeah. maybe a guy comes in and he's just, he's fucking up the chemistry. And yeah. even though he's maybe a good ass athlete, yeah. but he's talking shit outside the gym and he's just, I, I think that's, I think that's with every sport. Yeah, that you have even yeah. in the NFL, you get kicked out. You right. know, so yeah, I think if a guy's bringing down the organization, he's got to go. Yeah. How do you manage when two people in the same team? Then let's say they're both doing really well; they're both in the same weight class. Now mm -hmm. it's time for them to fight each other. Yeah. How is that managed, or does one person usually leave? Both. It's mm -hmm. either it's either managed to where we split the coaching up, or that person will leave and go to another camp. I know that like Kamar Usman and uh, fucking drawing a blank. Um, the guy he's fighting, they were teammates for a long time. And Usman actually left the gym and now he's training in another camp. And obviously, you know, they both are a part of that team, but one person had to step away because it just got too close. And sometimes you just don't have enough coaches. 
Right. Right. So a lot of teams won't, they have too many fighters and not enough coaches. So mm-hmm. then you have mm-hmm. to go to a different camp in order for you to. Well, you also got to think that he's going to see the strategy in a sense too, right? How much, how much of a going into a fight yeah. is, is the strategy piece? Are you for are, sure? Okay. Yeah. And it's then, different. yeah, roll, take me because, uh, you know, as a spectator and n- not as familiar with the sport, mm-hmm. I just, when I see a fight, I see, you know, five, six, seven coaches back there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What are all their roles and what mm-hmm. does that look like from a, a strategy standpoint going into a fight? I mean, you might, if for MMA, you might have a BJJ coach, a wrestling coach, a striking coach, and then you might have an MMA coach that puts it all together. It's kind of like a Mike Brown, like he puts it all together, or it would be like a Dean Thomas who okay. puts it all together. Um, and then those people will come together and organize a strategy based around their particular role, yeah. right, and their strong suit. Now, if a fighter com- is coming from a background of wrestling, well, then his main priority, his game plan is going to be centered around wrestling. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, it just makes sense. Whatever the strong suit is, that's where we have to go with. Now, if the opponent has equal wrestling, well, then we have to kind we have to kind of balance that out. So now we have to increase his ability to stop a takedown on top of the fact increasing his ability to strike. Yeah. So, have, you, what, have you had some fighters who you think are like uh, really, really good at like changing their game plan? Like, oh, you yeah. know, that this is the, they're yeah. normally a great wrestler, but you could coach them and say, hey, we're fighting somebody that that pretty much gets canceled out. I want you to really focus here. And do uh, you- so from I, I would say even mid mid fight, the guys that do it really well is John Jones and GSP. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Those are the two guys that, that really know how to take something and turn it into something even better. Oh, right? wow. Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. What now? Uh, if, if somebody who's listening right now is interested in the sport and is thinking they don't want to compete in the sport, but they want to learn something for self defense, mm-hmm. and you know they don't have a lot of time, right? So the average person might do something two or three days a week. I've heard people say, "Oh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is the best single thing to learn for mm-hmm. self defense." Other people say boxing. Yeah. Do you have one that you would pick? Muay oh, Thai. I don't know if I like Muay Thai for self defense. I think I think Muay Thai is a great art. I think if you are looking to do something in the world of striking and you want to involve kicks, Muay Thai would be better than let's say Taekwondo. Yeah. In a sense, um, it's easier, it's faster to get a, to get a hold of, I guess you would mm. say. But from an average person, from of a, a defensive standpoint, yes, I would say Jiu Jitsu BJJ would be the most optimal. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and that's like, just because most street fights end on the ground, right? Yeah, I mean, well, every, every fight I've been into ended up on the ground, whether well, I like it or not. You can stop them real quick, right? Yeah, but then again, you also have the factor of, okay, I'm not going to go to prison if right, I punch right, this guy uh, and knock him yeah. out and maybe cause some irreversible damage, right? Where I can Choke subdue him, sleep. put him to sleep a little bit, good point. You know, put his feet up in the air, and then we're good. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Wrap him up and send him off. Um, yeah. we, when you watched Tyson fight uh, over the was I think it was over the weekend or whatever, were you surprised at how well he was able to move? Was that shock? Because he's fifty four years old. Is that something shocking or is that no, no, no? Because it's like riding a bike. You know mm-hmm. that guy's been doing it forever since he was a kid. You know, and that was something that I was like, I mean, it's 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 impressive. Don't get me wrong, because who do you know is fifty five? Fucking right. He could have like easily that. just went eight donuts yeah. for the next last. But he's, all, years. But he's yeah. also always been impressive. <laughs> right. He's terrified. Exactly. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So yeah. why are y'all surprised? Yeah. <laughs> like you didn't see him when he was 22. He was yeah. fucking people up. Yeah. yeah. Like, How 55. old was Foreman uh, when he came back? Uh, he was late, 40s. 40s. late 40s. Oh, okay. Like 45. So, okay. Yeah, is it true that the last thing that a boxer loses is his power? Is yeah. that a true statement? I believe so. I believe so. I know. I know speed. Obviously, timing. You know, th- those things will go, but 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 sheer force into a punch, you know, and, and that's because I think you get that old man strength back, yeah. yeah, you know, and then as long as you can, you can put it in the right place, have the precision, the timing back, and that takes time, obviously, that was something that they were working on. That's mm. why it took them a long time to get it together. Now, now, what, okay, go ahead. I was going to say, what, what makes someone, because Tyson, I, I, was, I used to love uh, boxing as a kid, and I loved the old-time boxers. I was a big fan of watching them. And they were, their styles were so different. Uh, Muhammad Ali looked nothing like Mike Tyson mm-hmm. in the ring, but was incredibly impressive uh, in his own right. Mm-hmm. And, of course, Tyson was a monster. What made Tyson so good? What made someone like Muhammad Ali so good? Because they were so different. Their styles okay. looked so different. I think it was the belief in themselves to be honest with you, you know, because at the end of the day, everybody's going to have different styles that work towards their specific makeup and what they, honestly, it also has to do with, again, personality, right? Look at Tyson. He was a ferocious being. Like he, he was very dopamine 
driven. Yeah, how many right? guys were beat before they even walked in the ring with that guy? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So he had to have that style. Would you imagine him having a style like Muhammad Ali? Wouldn't make sense. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm going to eat your children. <laughs> <laughs> and then float around you like a butterfly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, so I think that that is one thing. Also, it's it's more about like understanding their body and how they move in space. And that that comes from training, but also the coach's eye, you know, and having a coach that can look at someone and be like, all right, this is going to be good for him. And then their development through time and how they're working inside the gym increases their confidence. Yeah. So like if, if like Conor McGregor, the reason why he was talking that shit because he had wars in the gym and he was beating people up and he, he put in the work. So now that switch has turned on to like, I'm, ultra confident because I know I've done everything possible to put myself in this position. And so you can't knock him for being a little bit overconfident because you're going to need that in a, in a world of everybody's a killer. Yeah. So I have to be a king amongst Kings. Yeah. yeah. Now what, what are some of the big misconceptions about um, what makes you a good uh, hard puncher? You know, mm-hmm. I, I mean, is it, you know, I'm strong mm-hmm. in the gym, therefore I can punch hard. Is it, uh, you know, I, I no. swing. Like, what, what are the, some of the misconceptions where people are like, oh, yeah, that, that guy should be able to punch pretty hard, but you're no, like, no. I, I got that debate of, like, you know, everybody says, oh, you're born with punching power, or you're born with knockout power, and don't get me wrong, like, genetically, your genetic makeup and your limb length and your torque angles and how you put your punches together is going to give you a stronger, more powerful punch, and where you place it is definitely going to give you that. I think, like, a guy like... Uh, was like powerful punchers. Name some powerful punchers that we had. George Foreman was a, yeah. was a hard hitter back then. If you look at his limb length, like you look at how long his arms were and how he he produced force and put it through his opponent as opposed to just trying to, you know, put it and snap it mm-hmm. back. Like he punched through his opponent. So it's it has something to do with that. I don't think, I mean, strength does play an underlining role because force is obviously going to be one part of the equation when you're talking about power output. Mm-hmm. But when it when you're talking about like like let's say for instance and i go back to this because this guy i work with is dustin you know he's not the strongest guy in the gym but he can lay you out Mm -hmm. he's got a he he can cry he Mm -hmm. can i mean he's got i mean his last five fights i think he's got five knockouts Mm -hmm. you know so he can crack and obviously conor mcgregor's not the most you know you're not he's not gonna go in a strongman competition anytime soon right but he can crack too so i think it i think at the end of the day it's how you place your punches how you create torque and and also how you um, understand where to place it from a precision standpoint. Yeah. Now, yeah. You, you've been in this game for a really long time, and you've seen the evolution of like science with sports performance mm-hmm. and, uh, and everything from PEDs to supplementation and diet. Tell me a little bit about what you've seen with all those things and then the evolution of the sport with MMA. I think we're getting more educated on, on recovery methods um, with the PEDs. I mean, obviously, you've seen people disintegrate in the sport mm-hmm. based off of USADA. Right. Right. USADA came in and a lot of guys went phew, right right yeah. back down. Yeah, I remember the Pride guys came mm-hmm. over to UFC and everybody lost 15 pounds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, let's 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 talk about this because there there is some uh, arguments on this. Like some people think that it's a massive advantage to uh, have PDs, but we talk about, you know, what what's what's more of an advantage? A guy that is naturally at 205 pounds in a badass fighter mm-hmm. or a guy that would normally be 175 juiced up to get to 205? Uh, we make the argument from just a fitness professional and understanding the body really well that I would think the natural guy at 205 is yeah. actually at an advantage. For sure, yeah. And I get you on that, 100%. But the guys that don't understand that from a physiological level, right, from biochemistry level, they're like, oh, no, he's cheating because right. he had to add something to himself, right? right? Whereas that they could be taking creatine and BCAAs and all this other shit, but because it's androgynous and you put it in with a syringe now it's bad yeah yeah. you know what i mean yeah yeah so that's the negative side effect i mean what you where do you stand i don't give a shit about everybody else i Mm -hmm. have my opinion on what what i just said do you agree with that or do you disagree when it comes down to a sport that's one-on-one i believe you should have an even playing field okay right so you should test both of them and see where their test levels lie yeah if one is over the other well then yes you can do some trt at that time Mm -hmm. to bring their levels the same Okay. To maximize 
equal equal balance. That's an interesting. Pers- you think that that we may see that in the future because there's so much of this. Maybe eventually we just say, listen, we're just instead of trying to say he took uh, you know all these PDs, this guy didn't, or this guy did a better job of hiding it, this guy didn't. Why don't we just straight up see where each guy's levels are and make yeah. sure they're equal going into a fight? The problem is, is that that takes too much time and yeah. energy. Right. Mm -hmm. Because it's hard to even match up guys now and guys take fights on short notice. Yeah. So how are you going to get your blood work done? And then you got to, you know what I mean? There's also so many factors like you could have one person could have more androgen receptors. Mm -hmm. So his testosterone is lower, but his testosterone is more effective in his body. Right. Mm -hmm. So that Mm -hmm. could also uh, play a role. Um, but yeah, when it comes to weight classes, I mean, okay, in the real world, uh, you street fights. Yeah. If you're bigger, um, there's an advantage there, but when you're all when you're all weighing the same, you're 175, you're 175. Mm-hmm. Um, I I would speculate, in my opinion, the PEDs like anabolic steroids really only make an advantage, give you an advantage with recovery, allowing you to not hurt yourself because otherwise you're the same weight as the other guy. Yeah. And if you got to juice well, yourself up to that weight, well, not to mention, like you know, when you take anabolic steroids, it may help you build muscle, but you still have things like you know tissue and ligaments and bones. And mm-hmm. the natural guy has got the bone structure to support a two hundred five person. The guy sure. who yeah. was one seventy and juiced up to two five, his yeah. bones didn't grow to be a two hundred five. Plus, guy. let's talk about this for a second, Phil. I'd love your mm-hmm. opinion on this. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you gain a, if you're good at a skill at one hundred and seventy five pounds, mm-hmm. and you decide to gain fifteen pounds. You've mm-hmm. lost some timing and some skill because yeah. you're not really used to your body. You're now 185 yep. or 190 pounds. Yep. You got to move different. I mean, is that is that an accurate statement? Yeah, you lose your leverages. Um, you un- like again, you have to learn how to move in space a little bit differently, especially if you don't have a long long amount of time to get used to that weight. Because mm-hmm. I, I went up, so I was I fought at 155, and I walked around at like 175, and then. I went up to 170 and walked around at 205, and that training process at 205 was way different than 175. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like different and, size human. And then on top of that, energy expenditure. So now it's like, okay, I need to learn how to move more efficiently with the body that I have now because I, I'm putting out a large amount of energy here. Mm-hmm. You know, so mm-hmm. I think that plays a huge role in conditioning too as well. So if I'm gonna go ahead and build a guy up to another weight class, I'm gonna make sure that I give him the adequate amount of energy output so that when we train or when he goes into the fight, he has that training process down pat. And so that I can maximize my time there, but also equal out his efficiency of movement so that when he gets into the fight, he knows how to move in space. Okay, okay. So I have a question for you. It's a little controversial. Um, And uh, I know where I stand and we've made comments on this in the past, but more and more we're seeing um, transgender athletes compete in uh, with other athletes. Mm-hmm. So somebody's, let's say, born uh, a man, and then they transition to female, and then they get their hormone levels down to what you would see with another female, and they say, mm-hmm. oh, it's we're on level playing field. We can all compete together. Mm-hmm. Um, you've seen this a little bit in MMA. There was uh, one fighter that did that, and, it, and I, I watched the fights, and it was a little yeah. bit – it was pretty brutal – yeah. Do you think that that's crazy? Is there would would you have an advantage even if you brought your testosterone levels down, even if you come you you transitioned, but you were born a man, went through puberty as a man, and you lived as a man for so long? Are there just differences in things like bone structure? And I mean, how do what do you feel about that? I don't know. I mean, it's it's difficult to say because if the hormones are matching at that particular time, but also you got to look at like okay, strength levels and 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 how well they're able to produce that power. And this is just different. Like female structure is different than male structure. And if they can get their levels down to that degree, I don't I don't see it being a big issue. But at the end of the day, if they're fighting at 125, but you used to be like a 145 pound man, well now you're looking at like, okay, well, that's kind of an advantage, obviously. Yeah. So it's the same thing as saying, okay, I'm gonna take PEDs and go ahead and fight again. Yeah. Well, I know this from the fitness space and from bodybuilding. I mean, if you're on steroids for 20 years and you mm. decide to go off there's a certain level of muscle yeah, and attain. strength that you're going to keep mm-hmm. so for me it's like you know you got an athlete who was a man for 20 years and <laughs> then they decide to change and sure now their hormone levels are like a woman's hormone levels i still think there's an advantage in my opinion yeah yeah that's that's definitely true that's where i'm getting at with that is, yeah. that, is your muscle and your ability to build muscle is still there mm. you know to that degree it's not it's not obviously as much yeah. as it was but yeah, it is a disadvantage when you're talking about that. Now, if you put that individual up against another killer, like let's say Amanda Nunes, 
<laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and have fun. Good luck. You know yeah. <laughs> she beats up dudes in the gym now. It <laughs> don't matter. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it don't even matter. Huh? Yeah. That's awesome. As a, as a coach, uh, and when you look around at your peers, what are some of the biggest mistakes you see other coaches making with fighters, whether it be nutritional related, mm-hmm. recovery related, setting up for the fight? What are the big mistakes you see? Um, I see a well, big mistake that I see with uh, physical prep coaches and strength conditioning coaches is trying to fit a training program because that's what they're supposed to be doing. Right. So what do you mean? Explain that. So like, OK, trying to fit a square peg in a round hole because that's what it says in the NC, NSCA book, uh, okay. right? Not understanding the athlete, not understanding the situation, the circumstances, and then molding your programming based mm-hmm. upon their individual needs. It's context specific. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So with that, I'd rather see more of understanding what the actual individual needs at that particular time and not be married to this one particular system yeah. that you learned in a weekend course. That's interesting mm-hmm. because that's similar in our field, right? So yeah. just training clients, like that's uh, what makes a really good coach is the 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 guy or girl who can see the client and meet them where they're at. Mm-hmm. Yeah, even though we've all read the same certifications mm-hmm. and books and know like what's the ideal protocol to take someone through, yeah. depending on where they're at in their journey yeah. makes all the difference on how I start them. So similar. Yeah, it comes with experience too. And then it comes with experience with working with those individuals that you're working with, right? That population, right? So like with fighters, I've been working with fighters and I've been a fighter for 10 plus years. So like a guy like that has a large amount of time in the game, I may not be going through that particular system of how you should be doing it based on what books say. Mm -hmm. I'm giving him what he needs at that particular time because we only have that limited amount of time. Right. So the, the scheduling plays a big role, you know, the, again, the circumstance of what they have to go through on a daily basis. Yeah. Right. So that, that is where I see a big difference where I should, I want to start to see more, uh, of an understanding of what the individuals actually needs at that particular time. Now, how do you handle like uh, an extreme weight cut? Like this is mm-hmm. something that we need to prepare for. Maybe it's like not a huge mm-hmm. amount of time that you have allotted yeah. to strategize for that. It's something yeah. that just got thrown at you. Mm-hmm. How do you do that in a way where it still kind of keeps the athletes safe? I wouldn't recommend it. You know, I like to see guys sitting around 12 to 15% somewhere when they start fight camp. Sometimes they're up to 20% from scale weight. Oh, I see. See what I mean? So if in as of now I'm done, like I don't, I don't really do a whole lot of weight cutting. I have somebody else do that shit. Cause I can't deal with that shit anymore. Mm. Like I've done it on, on pretty much all my life. And then working with the fighters, just the goal really though, is one, we want to see from a, from a body composition standpoint, how much muscle mass do they have? How much fat mass do they have? How much water are they holding? And then I can kind of adequately gauge how much we can take off safely and effectively mm. and then put back on once the once we step off the scale because the rehydration and the refueling process is the mm. most important Yeah, because that's going to dictate the, the performance. And they don't allow uh, IVs anymore, right? No, is not in the UFC, but okay. any other promotion, yes. Mm. So how so how much weight – so you said 12%, 15%. Is mm. that – that's the beginning of the – Two month, three month, four month training camp, or yeah, is about that two months? About is two that months. two months? Mm-hmm. Okay, and then what about like the day before? How much mm-hmm. leeway do they get? What? How much weight do you? Ideally, I like to see them sitting around five pounds out. Okay, so they're right. they're gonna try and cut five pounds of water out to mm-hmm. get on the scale, mm-hmm. and that's usually how how is that usually done? So there's two processes. You could do either a bath or you could do the sauna. Depends on the person, really, right? Depends on what they like, right? Some people like the bath. Some people like the sauna. Right. The reason why we don't go fully on the sauna, because, again, it can drain you a lot more than, say, a bath and a bath is a lot faster. It's a lot more efficient when the if we're in the hotel room, we can just go to a bath. Sometimes a lot of hotels won't have a, a sauna. So we have to drive to a gym or something like that. But we put them in a bath and we close the door and we're fine. And we can just do it in the hotel. There's not a whole lot of stress that has to be involved. Obviously, stress is going to hold on to as much water as possible. All right. Right. So we want to de-stress. We want to work on breathing techniques, diaphragmatic breathing, bring down it to a parasympathetic state. And then from there, I can adequately gauge, all right, how much time we need to get two, three pe- two or three pounds off, um, let's say, the day before. Mm-hmm. And then the morning of, we'll do one more bath to get the rest off. Is it common that you see a, an athlete stressing out so much about their fight that they just hang on to all the water and you can't get it it's out? It's not even about the fight. It's about the weight cut. 
Oh, they're stressing oh, about the they, weight they cut. They stress more about the weight cut than the fight. Oh, wow. Huh. That's why it's so it's so vital that you like like you come in with the right percentage already. On top of that, they have to be at the right body weight when they start camp 6 weeks out, 3 weeks out, 1 week out, and now they're like, "Okay, I'm in a good place." because mm -hmm. you're in your head all camp. It's funny because this is very similar to what the conversation I'd have when I was coaching competitors for bodybuilding. It's like, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, once they find out that you can help them and you're good at it, everybody wants you to help them and they call you up, you know, hey, I want to do a show in three months. Yeah. And then I find out where they're at and I say, no, I, I won't take you. I want yeah. to, you got to come in. All the real work, in my opinion, or at least for that sport, is done leading into it. Sure, You've yeah. done a good job then that I know I can, okay, mathematically figure this out and go, okay, I can slowly taper you off and I'll be able to present this. Physique. I remember, I think it was the ultimate fighter. It was like one of the first few seasons and one of the guys dropped 20 pounds. Wow. I think it was like the day yeah, before. About, yeah. 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 That happens. It, it does happen. What's the most you've ever seen? Uh, 30 pounds. Holy Whew. shit. Hold on. 30 pounds the day before the day before had it been a big boy though. Right? No, no, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was a 35 er What? Yeah. How was the what? energy in that fight? It was terrible. Oh, he I bet. Died. He, he lost, I mean, he was dying <clears throat> doing it, and then he had no energy, you know, come fight night because he just drained himself too oh, fast. Yeah. Well, you that's what, right. okay. So, so what does the re, I guess, hydration process look mm -hmm. like? Let's say you cut, yeah. let's say you cut eight pounds, right? So mm -hmm. a little bit more than the five that you like. So mm -hmm. they came in, they didn't do, maybe they fucked up with their diet a little bit, and mm -hmm. they're like, okay, I got to drop eight pounds of water. Mm -hmm. um, they do the weight, they weigh in, they make weight. Mm -hmm. Now, what does it look like getting them ready to to fight? Because that's exhausting. I've lost yeah. a few pounds in the sauna. You feel like shit afterwards. Yeah. yeah. So first and foremost, we want to get electrolytes in, hands down, right? So we we do a mix of a three liter mix of electrolytes, and then we'll throw in some branched chain amino acids, some creatine too as well. And then after they're three liters, and they do that every fifteen minutes. So it takes them fifteen minutes per liter to finish, and then they can have some food. Now that food is obviously going to consist of some type of fast digestive carbohydrate and some protein. We try to leave the fats out of it as much. Now, as possible. why are you timing the 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 just rehydration? For just for digestion. So if they go too fast, what happens? They just get bloated. They feel like shit. Mm. Again, and again, they get lethargic. Oh, so right. we want to slowly sip it, and we want to make sure it's cold enough to where it's cooling down the body too. And well. and now is this like Pedialyte, or do you have your own mix? It's, it's a mix. Now Eric Pena is a guy that I work with. He used to work with George Lockhart, so he's got all of his techniques from George Lockhart. But what we do is, it's usually a mix of obviously water mixed with coconut water, and then we do noon tabs because it has oh, yeah, caffeine yeah. too uh -huh. as well. We'll do some branched chain amino acids in there, and it's it all depends like the. The formulation of it, right? The dosages depend on the body weight and what they've lost and what they need to put back on. Usually you want them up around 10 to 12 pounds come fight night mm. from their scale weight. So Phil, when you see these guys uh, get popped, right? And they make the claim that it was from some herbal supplement that they just <laughs> took. I mean, who do we just have like two fights ago? Remember the guy, the, his, his gyno was out really, really bad. Oh, he got right. Out of Sonya? Yes, Asanya. yes, yeah. yeah and, he uh, said he blamed it on marijuana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's technically you can do that. I heard it's possible. You know, you, you got to smoke a, a lot, lot of weed. Though, so, right? okay. Hey, 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 you know who out of Sonya is, man? <laughs> yeah, he probably does he smoke a lot, a lot of weed. <laughs> <laughs> So I mean, is it, it? I mean, when you see that when they come out with that, uh, do you just laugh and say, "Yeah, right," or yeah. Is it, do you think that it's, uh, that's happening? Oh, uh, man, I, with the with the weed. Well, I mean, weed. And, I mean, yeah. like John Jones, Jones or something like that. Where well, like, John, comes John, out. we knew John was fucking doing crazy shit. <laughs> okay, like, yeah, right. Like yeah. everybody knows that. Like, <laughs> no, cocaine. Story. That was in my Frosted Flakes. But John, <laughs> like John, admits it though. He's like, yeah, hey, I, I was high when I fought Gustafson. Like, <laughs> like right. you know. So I mean. Yeah, I, I do believe like with with these guys, they need an outlet in a sense, and so they may turn to marijuana, they may turn to cocaine, they may, yeah, because they're so like rigid, right? Yeah, everything is everything so is regimented and to the T. And when their fight's done, most of them, especially at the highest level, they're like, "Fuck this! I need to cut loose. I need to yeah, unwind, and I have all this money." And I'm fucking going to Tahiti and I'm smashing bitches all day long. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. it. it is is so is marijuana still a banned substance in in, in no probably, it's not no anymore. it's only during fight week I believe. Mm. Oh, so so if you test positive uh, after the fight for marijuana, you can get disqualified or whatever. I believe so. Yeah, if you, it's if it's going to enhance something, 
But the problem is that's that what I was we saying. all know that weed's not going to enhance <laughs> 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 performance. Well, I remember but. when Nick Diaz, I think it was Nick Diaz. I remember I remember what fight he was. He won, and then afterwards he tested for a lot of marijuana. And I'm yeah. like, he they shouldn't disqualify him. He should get another award. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, he overcame the obstacles. Right? <laughs> yeah. you know what I'm that's saying? crazy. Didn't Mike Tyson yeah. say he smoked a bunch of weed before his last fight just now? Uh, probably. Oh, I mean, he owns great. a he's owned like a company now. He's yeah, got, yeah. That's I think that was a promotion for his shit. Yeah, hundred percent. That's, 100%. What, that that's 100%. what that was. Yeah, yeah. I'm still whooping ass and I'm smoking dope every day. So you think it shouldn't Plug. be you? You think it shouldn't be banned because it's not really a performance enhancer? No, no, I don't think so. I think a lot of my guys need it, you know, because they need they need again their dopamine drop dominant. They, they need, need to chill brains. the fuck out. Yeah, they need to calm the fuck down. <laughs> oh, wow, interesting. Just go home and relax. Yeah. Now, I, so so I remember when I was training in jujitsu, there were a few MMA guys that were in there that were you know Mike Swick, good good friend of mine actually. Nice. He used to. Uh, he was a trainer actually for me at 24 fitness at one point. That's how we became friends. And mm-hmm. I remember hanging out with him and then he would bring, you know, John Fitch and some other mm-hmm. fun. And I remember going out with them and how chill and humble they were. Yeah. And I remember thinking like, Oh, I'm going to, these pro fighters, are they going to like start a fight? Or, no, man, they were like, <laughs> it's the opposite. Yeah, yeah. Like you could want to fight. Like, yeah. Exactly. They could, people could bump them, say something to them. They're yeah. like, whatever. Is that common? Is that a common super thing with common, fighters? Super common. I, I was a guy that like, not to say that I'm like fucking Mike Fitch or, or John Fitch or any of those guys and Mike Sweet, but I tell you this, when I started training, I stopped fighting in the streets 100%. I was like, man, I do this shit every day. I don't want to It's like work. It becomes yeah. work. Yeah. I don't want to fight you. Don't you. Get in some, guy talking, either, right? some guy yeah. talking shit to you. You're like, I'm too tired to work right well, now. Well, honestly, and, you, and, you, and you're so confident in your abilities. Right, right. Like, yeah. bro, for real. That's what Swick told me because I remember right. talking to Mike about that and he goes, I, he goes, I know what I can do to somebody if in on the street and I don't want to do it. And he goes, do you? He goes, if a five year old comes up to you and wants to challenge you to fight, do we get threatened? And I said, no. Yeah. And he goes, well, that's how I feel with somebody. Exactly. You know? Yeah, yeah. You know that the consequences of what right. may happen will actually get you more in trouble than them. Yeah. So you're like, ah, not worth fuck it. it. Yeah. yeah. So let's say you, as a parent, because I have kids, mm-hmm. uh, and let's say you have a, a child that's mm-hmm. a bit rebellious. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe they're getting in trouble and getting into fights and, you know, not really, you know, doing a good job or whatever. You think fighting is a great outlet for them? Get them in an MMA gym? That'll help them out? 100%. 100%. I think that that should be with young kids, uh, especially young boys, that have a lot to prove. They want to always prove something, especially to the father. Um, My son's six years old, and he's with all the fighters all the time, and he's, like, shadow boxing everywhere we go. Uh, You know, and he wrestles and he does all the stuff, but... I think that that's going to give him a, a level of, of confidence and develop his ability to calm down at times where things can get a little bit hectic and he can deal with those stresses. And if you have a guy, a kid, a young boy that's very riled up and, and he's looking for attention, I believe that, or let's say for instance, you're a mother and the father's not involved and you need to have a father figure. I think right. a, a, a coach or a martial arts instructor, a sensei, whatever you want to call him is going to be that guide for that individual and help him develop himself as a man appropriately, you know, and carry himself. Now, is that, is that actually pretty, I would think that would be pretty common in the fight world. Is there a lot of uh, fatherless fighters where they, yeah. they okay. 100%. Yeah, oh, Cause wow. I think that that was one of the reasons, and we, we kind of talked about that um, earlier, but I think a lot of times when people get into fighting is because they're looking for something. They're looking for that individual to impress almost and it's maybe themselves. It may be the guy that wasn't in their lives. So, yeah, I do see that a lot. And you see that a lot with, like, even any sport yeah. athlete, really, if you think about it, right? Mm-hmm. I grew up with a lot of guys that are in the NFL. I played with a lot of guys that are in the NFL. None of those guys had had, had fathers to look up to or, or know how to be a man. Mm-hmm. So they turned to football and looked at their coaches mm. for advice and for guidance in that way. Now, talk about the the humbling effects of uh, of, of fighting, of training in a in a gym, a boxing gym, or Brazilian Jiu Jitsu gym, or because I remember specifically walking in, um, you know, two hundred and twenty pounds, strong dude, a little mm-hmm. bit of judo background, and sparring with the this one hundred and sixty pound skinny flexible uh, instructor, yeah. and tapping out, I don't know, five times in five minutes, and went outside and threw up and <laughs> was humbled and signed All up. Right. And signed up, and it, it was a great learning lesson. Talk a little bit about the humble, the the value of going to a fight gym and just getting your ass kicked. But that show, 
I'll tell you about that, but that shows who you are as a person, though, because you got a lot of guys that think they're the shit, big, you know, muscle-bound guys that go in there and get wrecked by a 135-pound jiu-jitsu kid, and they never come back. They, they can't handle it. Yeah, and they talk shit about the gym, too. <laughs> yeah, <of laughs> like, they talk shit about the kid. They're like, bro, he tapped you like five times, put you to sleep. We got to put your legs up, shake you out. But, yeah, I think, I think that that definitely will humble you in a way because – you're especially in jujitsu, man, because you're it's in the gi, you're like <laughs> yeah. in the straight jacket. Like, yeah. you're just like, oh shit, no, don't grab this, and fucking you're getting choked out. And then, like, you have no abilities at all. Whatever you think you had, no, how I don't care how strong you are, the leverages and the techniques will get you'll get nullified quick, yeah, you know. But don't get me wrong, if you do have strength and the technique, however. Now you're getting dangerous. Yeah. Now you're going to be leveling up. Yeah. But you get humbled, uh, you know, really quick. So from a personal development standpoint, um, what do you learn more from from winning in the gym or getting your ass kicked in the gym? Uh, Well, 100 percent getting your ass kicked in the gym Mm. because you. Well, here's the thing. and And I like that question. That's actually a really good question because you definitely need wins in the gym because you need to build your confidence. Sure. Right. But you need small wins in the gym. You don't need to dominate in the gym. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So, like, I don't want to go in there with a training partner. You don't want to be the best dude in there, right? N- the well, you're not going to get, get you're not going to get better. Right. Your confidence may be somewhat high, but then you're looking at yourself like they, these guys suck, though. Yeah. So, like, and then I step into a, a UFC cage or whatever. Doesn't matter what it is, and you're like, but those guys weren't as good as my opponent, mm. you know. But now, if you go in there and you have a small victory in a sparring match where you you put together a combination really well, or you slip that punch, you had great defense, you. You stop that takedown, and that guy's a, a world class wrestler. Yeah. Even though he took you down, f- you know, fucking nine times out of 10, but that 10th time, I got that. And then you go into the fight, and you're like, that guy's not nowhere near as good as my training partner. Mm. Do you recall a story where you seen like a, like a no name kid come into a gym that's like American Top Team where you got a bunch of badasses and you've watched him work his way up like relatively quick? Does that ever happen? I believe it does. Um, you know, with Top Team, it's more of like a collection of like people coming in that already developed already themselves. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I've definitely seen like Jillian Robertson, who's in the UFC now. I've known that girl since she was 16. You know, she came to my gym when I had when I was running boot camps for like extra money mm. um, doing like my boot camp. And then she's like, I want to fight because she knew that I was fighting. And she goes, I go, well, go talk to Dean. She signed up. <clears throat> And worked her way up, and now she's in the UFC. Mm. Oh wow! You know? awesome. She's like, she's like, gonna be breaking the top ten. All right, now, now, uh, so there was a story. I don't know if this is true, um, but there was a story of uh, when Hulk Hogan uh, first became a wrestler. He went to a, a submission wrestling Japanese school, and he went in there, big dude. Obviously, he's a massive guy, mm-hmm. cocky, loud. You know that personality, and they wouldn't let him in. And then the he finally got them to let him in. And the instructor uh, knee locked him and busted up his, his knee to teach him a lesson. And then the story goes that Hulk Hogan came back, was humbled, and he you know ended up learning. I've also heard stories of jujitsu schools having their arm breaker. The dude that's in the class that the instructor sees a new guy come in, act like a you know loud mouth or whatever, and the instructor looks at the arm breaker and says, "Hey, why don't you go spar with them to teach?" Is that true? Does that really happen? Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh shit! You For have, real? You have your enforcers. For sure, enforcers. There you go. Yeah, I, we had enforcers in our in our gym. I was one at one point. Like I'd be one, and then we have one other guy. Those are the guys that really just kind of have pride in the gym. They like they're very prideful of like the culture they've the built. Culture they you don't built. want someone coming. They're in the fuck. team guy. Like yeah. they're that mm-hmm. guy. So that's the and then they're the guy that just don't give a fuck either. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, those are you'll get you'll get that. Well, that's funny. That mirrors like hockey. So exactly. hockey, hockey has hockey, that, right? hockey has enforcer yeah. and he's the one who just he protects yeah. everybody on the team, cares mm-hmm. about the culture, the family of it. And you yeah. mess with one of my guys, I mean, he's going to come in yeah. and power break your teeth. Yeah, yeah, I had that with my my. I was not that guy in this when I trained, but I did have an experience where the coach looked at me and he. He says, Sal, why don't you go against him? He gave me this look like, I'm like, oh mm-hmm. shit, you expect me to like yeah. fuck him up? Like, oh yeah. no, I don't know if I want to do that. Do you have a story of, uh, of uh, when you had to actually, when you had to enforce? So yeah, there was one guy that came from a, a Krav Maga school. Oh, <laughs> Krav Maga? Uh, he was trying to say that Krav Maga was better than MMA and- oh, you know, I'll poke ooh, your eyes out. Yeah, and I was like, all right, well- Our moves I are so deadly. I guy wearing a shirt. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, yeah, our, yeah. our moves are so deadly, we don't train yeah. full contact. I know, I know. And he was like, I hate to say it, but he was probably like in his 40s. 
And like you could tell like he was just he wanted to test himself. He didn't really want to sign up. Like he just wanted to go in there and spar mm. and test his Krav Maga against MMA. Yeah. Mm. So I, I get it wasn't it wasn't Dean wasn't there at the time, but one of the other managers was there. And, and again, they kind of basically were like, "Yo, we got this new guy. He's coming in from the Krav Maga school, and it's like, I need you to I need you to handle that. <laughs> just just <laughs> I need you to handle that. And so no doubt, got it. <laughs> so and I was probably and I was getting ready for a fight. I think I was I was close to like six weeks out. So at, at that time, you're peaking right I'm now. Peaking yeah. right. So yeah. So he came in the gym and. Uh, I seen him putting on his gloves and I was like, and, and I told him, I was like, you don't need your gloves today. I walked by him. I was like, you don't need your gloves today. So he like, he, <laughs> yeah, I don't he plan like, on you looked at me. He was like, <laughs> he was like, oh fuck. So I had him put on his MMA gloves and I had big gloves. I had 16s and he had MMA. So like he was, and I was like, don't let up. I was like, let's go. Show me your Krav Maga yeah. today. <laughs> so I remember, I guess the bell rang and I hit him with a low calf kick and swept him right off his feet. Kind of like, fuck. And I, I smashed his leg. Like I was kicking through his whole entire body just whop. He fell, hit the ground, boom, got back up. I was like, get up, right? Because I wasn't going to go on the ground. We weren't doing that. It was yeah. all stand up. Yeah, so, yeah. and so he got back up. Then I hit him in the body. I think I, I kicked him in the liver. Yeah. And, he went, and he fucking dropped. <laughs> it's like, get back up. So he kept getting back up, get back up. Then I just, I just said, uh, fucking, I went down. I hit him to the, I hit him with a jab to the body and overhand, overhand left because I'm southpaw. And it was over. It was all over. Oh, now, when that happened, did he get up Oof. and is he like, "Hey, man, that was really good." I'm, you know, yeah. Thanks for like, Th thanks for remember. teaching me. Or was he like, "I'm out"? No, nah, I, I I felt bad for the guy afterwards because like he really didn't know what the fuck was happening. Yeah. And then I was like, "Yo, I was like, you good, man?" And he was like, "Yeah, man. What the fuck, man?" Yeah. He's like, you know you really hit me hard. I was like, I was like, nah, man, that's how we spar, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, have you ever seen, cause I, uh, I, remember, I'll, I told this story so many times on the podcast, but it was just a great memory. We had a female instructor and there was a guy, a new guy that came in to sign up mm -hmm. and he didn't want to spar against her cause she's, no, no, I don't want to go against girls and whatever. She said, no, you can go. And he tried to drag her off the mat several times. So finally she put him to sleep and he mm. literally went, he choked out, went to sleep. He was so embarrassed. He, yeah. he walked, you ever seen anything like that where a guy comes in and, and oh, he yeah. spars with one of the girls mm -hmm, and he's, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> tell I, me a story. Was, it was like a big juice head, like hundred uh, percent. It was one of, one of the bodybuilders that, that was like local to the, to the area. Okay. And we had a girl. They don't have they don't have fragile egos, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he came in. He had and it was funny. He had like a stringer tank top on too. It was it was great. Were the I nipples, was like, were the this nipples broke out the sides? My, was, my, were my nipples, guy, nipples my guy. Hard and all. Like I was. Oh, oh man, just finishing. And he, I think shit. he had like you know he, he was greased up. You know he had he was he looked like he was from uh, the Jersey Shore, like yeah. straight out. Oh, yeah. wow. And this was back at that time when the Jersey. Remember the Jersey Shore? Uh, yeah. Do I remember? Well, yeah, I'm shit. Italian. Fucking. But back when that like. When that show came out, yeah. everybody was dressing like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. He was like there, so he was he was he was all in it. Yeah. And so, um, actually, my girlfriend at the time, um, she was a jujitsu purple belt and a very highly competitive purple belt. So a different level yeah. of purple belt, right? Not just like I just go to the gym once yeah. or twice a week. Yeah, yeah. Like this is like I live this shit yeah. type purple belt. So. Yeah, um, he came and did jujitsu, and uh, and I was getting. I, I think I was getting ready for a fight, so I didn't do the class, but I was watching, and I was just watching to make sure he wasn't going crazy on my fucking girlfriend at the time. So I'm just sitting there or whatever, and um, I, th I they you know we started on our knees mm -hmm. right, and slapped hands or whatever, and then he was kind of like not engaging because he was like, oh man, she's a girl type yeah. shit. No, my girlfriend, or well, at the time my girlfriend jumped to his back basically wrapped both legs around him you know getting the guard got the seatbelt and he was like a fish out of water at this point <laughs> like trying to catch it looked like a a, a turtle on a shell <laughs> ah, 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 ah. and then he was like she already had everything locked in so he couldn't use his strength but he tried and then she just had good leverage snuck in the rear naked and he started Whoop. snoring within like three seconds <laughs> Now did he yeah. was he all right afterwards? Was he like, hey, yeah. that was cool? Or was yeah. he like, yeah, he was embarrassed as fuck? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, then, and then and then after that, he kind of left and never came back. Yeah, yeah. see, but I, I feel like that's like the that man. If you can get through that, like for me personally, like you know, I think the value of the real true value of of fighting. Yes, it's great to learn self defense. The fitness is awesome too. Mm -hmm. But the real value is just uh, you develop a healthy ego. You don't mm -hmm, have this huge mm -hmm. blow. Yeah. I remember, you know, even myself doing it, walking around the street and, and, and 
you don't you don't look around like you're some guy that want to dominate anybody. You know you know the real damage that fights can do. You have yeah. a different respect and value for it, and you learn from your mistakes and you get your ass kicked and you come back and you mm-hmm. you're ready to learn some more. Which I mean, is that not a skill that can apply to everything in life? Oh yeah, definitely. I think that transitions over to your work life, to your family life, everything involved. When I don't train, I feel like mad at myself. You know what I mean? Like I feel like what the fuck am I doing? Where's my purpose? Mm. You know? So like when I get back into it, like I, I just tore my ACL. Well, I didn't just tear my ACL. I just got surgery on it, but mm. I tore it last year. I think I tore it right. You before, did. Right. Yeah, after, you yeah. did. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, um, it was in jujitsu, but it was me being dumb, trying to get out of a position that obviously I didn't have the best. I was in, I wasn't in the best position to get out of that position. Mm. And so I ended up, you know, basically tearing my ACL completely. Um, but, when I was out of it, I was like, man, fuck, I missed training. So I had to do something. And then I was just kind of just rehabbing the shit out of it and then just coaching and golfing myself and coaching. But again, it's like, if I don't have that and it's not about like weightlifting is good. I like, I like to train. I like to get underneath load and, and, and lift and power lift and all that. But it's different when it's a martial art. It's different when you're like sparring. It's different when you're sure. doing jujitsu. It's different when you're wrestling. It's a way different, like, feeling afterwards like you feel accomplished to another degree you know what i mean oh yeah, yeah. The, the, again the personal development is just tremendous now you had you said you had a six-year-old son mm-hmm. is he growing up differently than you in the sense that did you have a hard life is his life a lot easier and if he says to you one day dad i want to i want to go bang in the ring i want to <laughs> go punch and, and get punched and i want to fight are you going to be like that's cool or are you going to say to him does no, it, you have a different life than I did. Are you know like what's what's your conversation going to be like if that happens? There will be a really hard life lesson, and then I will have to integrate in my ability to lead him in the proper ways that I didn't have mm-hmm. when I was growing up, and I grew up obviously way different than him. Um, from my perspective, like I grew up way rougher in a sense, and I'm trying to make sure that my son didn't grow up the way I grew up. Now, with that being said, am I going to let him do what he wants to do? Absolutely. But I'm going to guide him in the right ways to do it the right way, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Right. I want to make sure that he has all the things that he needs necessary so that if he wants to fight or do whatever, but also wants to go and go to a university and be a lawyer, then he can do both Mm -hmm. or he can do one or the other, depending on what his goals are and depending on, you know, where his life takes him. Yeah. But he always has to be ready at that time. And I want to make sure that I'm giving him guidance in order to do so. Mm. Yeah. I got one more question. I just have to get this in here. It's kind of like, uh, what are those, like you see a lot of, uh, uh, like mysticism and folklore out there in uh, martial arts and you see uh you know some of these moves like hollywood shows like so you've seen like the the crane kick was actually like landed and actually worked have you seen any other like crazy uh mcdojo type uh moves that worked this there's one uh from the uh, ufc the guy i don't know what fight it was but it's going it's making its rounds if you if you look it up but it's a spinning back kick the guy caught uh, like a body shot the opponent caught the body shot and the kids spun around and head kicked him oh wow oh wow and knocked him out oh yeah. sick Just flat oh Stiffing. wow i feel i feel I'm like have to youtube that i yeah. feel like the better that they the the the, the, the more it advances and the better all the athletes get the yeah. more you're gonna see yeah. Yeah. some crazy flashy guys, moves this guy was obviously an athlete yeah for sure. yeah because it used to be early days they said there was a second there where everybody's like head kicks are a waste of time don't train head kicks yeah. you're never gonna land one mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but now everybody then people got so good that <sighs> that Man. became an advantage and then they're like no spin kicks don't work there and it is right there i, I did see that one i didn't see this oh bro yeah, let me see let me see this <laughs> oh yes i remember like the first time i saw someone and use the cage to do like a Superman yeah. punch. Yeah, that was pissed. crazy. That was, that was amazing. Pissed. Yeah, that yeah. was crazy. The first time I did that. a kick, he climbed yeah. off the, yeah. the cage and kicked. Over. I I remember the first time I got wrist locked. That's when I thought wrist locks were a waste of time. I got caught <laughs> one. And I was like, oh shit, this actually yeah. can work sometimes. <laughs> yeah, watch this. Catch and boom. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh what? Yeah. Oh shit. Yeah, they're on a different he, level. He, he caught his ankle and he did a spinning like roundhouse yeah. kick. To the, I mean, the, oh. to, to the guy's defense, he did everything he he, he could supposed to. Yeah, the guy just. Wow. Shit. wow! Now, now I feel. Now, I'd love your opinion on this, Phil. You know, pe- people see this kind of stuff or whatever, they're gonna think, oh, "I'm gonna go train." Yeah. They're all gonna <laughs> practice that yeah. one move. You know, right? What's funny is that uh, again, my coach Dean was like, 
everybody's gonna do that in the gym <laughs> <laughs> because everybody did the pedal shit after, yeah, after right. that week yeah. everybody was doing it off the cage shit sure. I was trying to do it off the cage <laughs> so, I remember when I first saw the timing down so I got I got a self-awareness question for you so there's a lot of people that um, are aspiring trainers and coaches, and I would think in, in our uh, our profession, like one of the pinnacles or ultimate. I mean, I know as a young kid, I, I wanted to train pro athletes. You've reached that, right? You're you're training pro athletes. What is it about you that separates you from your peers that has allowed you to get to that level? You think? I mean, my ability to always want to scale and grow, progress on a daily basis. Having the ability to understand the individual more, um, taking my abilities from a science perspective and then integrating that into an art, whereas that a lot of people want to, again, fit that square peg in the round hole. Yeah. Whereas my goal is to actually understand the athlete first and foremost. There's a lot of psychology that goes about it. Yeah. And for me, I'm always trying to evolve the system in order for me to create what we need to from a success standpoint. So... I mean, I think that from generations of coaches that develop their own skill set, you got a lot of great coaches out there that are new and that can make something of themselves. I think that they are too worried about trying to be accepted by their peers and not worrying about the success that they can make their athlete. Mm -hmm. So again, you'll see it on social media where people will post things and you see like jargony words or like high scientific terms because they're trying to impress their peers right. as opposed to trying to actually get what what you need out of the athlete. That's ego. Yeah. That's all yeah. ego, man. It's like, you know, are you effectively communicating or are you just telling everybody, wanting people to think you're smart? Mm-hmm. You know what I find interesting about you? You don't see this a whole lot um, where usually what makes a good athlete doesn't make them a good coach. Mm-hmm. Uh, good athletes have incredible instincts and body awareness, and they don't always, usually they can't communicate it or coach it very well, but they mm-hmm. can do it themselves. Yeah. Coaches often, uh, obviously the stereotype is, they might not have the same instincts and in, in natural body awareness or abilities, but they just have a really good ability to communicate it. Um, you seem to have both, obviously you're a fighter, so and you communicate it very well. You're also very intelligent um, in, the, in you know talking to you from a trainer standpoint. You know, I've talked to a lot of fight coaches, you know uh, more about the human body and biomechanics and training than uh, most coaches I've, I've talked to, most trainers that I've talked to. But the, you're, the fact that you're a fighter also and a coach, does that help you connect with fighters differently than other coaches? Yeah, that's a big, that's a big thing too as well is that my ability from and, – and they respect that. I think that that was one thing that I started doing was, was a lot of the guys that didn't know me, I got them to realize that, yes, I was a, I was a fighter at one point. You know, and then from there, the buy in per se, quote unquote, was there. And for a lot of coaches, I'm not saying that you have to be a fighter or you have to play the sport, but you definitely should know how it feels. Of course. Right. From a biochemistry, from a biomechanic standpoint, but also from a from a psychological standpoint. And we go back to that. I think it's largely due to the fact that I know what they're thinking at what particular time, you know, at in camp, in the fight, whatever, because like we talked about, remember you asked me about, oh, they're worrying about the fight. Yeah. We're not worried about the fight because we're worrying about the weight cut because yeah. that's, mm-hmm. that's the first thing we got to accomplish. Mm-hmm. Right. So those little things like that, when you're talking about like strength and conditioning coaches or even, even skills coaches, some skills coaches have never fought before. Hmm. You know, you have... Uh, that's interesting. Yeah, like you have really big name coaches that never fought before, but they were able to put themselves in the position of their athletes Mm -hmm. and relay over information based upon what they know and how they perceive what they're feeling. Mm -hmm. So you have that connection there. And when you can develop that connection, and that's again going back to the art of coaching, is having the ability to reframe what you're trying to relay over so that the athlete can understand exactly what they're doing is appropriate for the sport. And then also you have invested your energy in getting them in the position to be successful in the fight and then outside of the fight in their careers going further. Mm -hmm. I think also coaches don't go the extra route. A lot of them, not, not all of them don't go the extra route because I'm still talking with fighters and athletes that are well retired that are done. 
but I still make sure that they're good. I'll make sure that they're doing some type of training or they're, they're, you know, they're progressing in other future endeavors that they want to do, whether it be business, whether it be, you know, whatever. Yeah. That's a good leader. And that's what you need to be as a coach. Mm. Right. I think that that was one thing that kind of separated me too, as well as I can lead by example, but also I can inform and teach as appropriate as possible for that particular individual. Mm. You mm-hmm. mentioned art and you've, and you've talked about mindset a lot. And you know, one thing that is for me interesting about mixed martial arts versus the other traditional combat sports in America, which I guess the most popular ones would have been boxing and wrestling is that they didn't, they lacked the, the art that you would see in martial arts, right? The, the meditation, the, I don't know what you want to call it, esoteric uh, aspect of martial arts, mm-hmm. which in MMA, obviously some of that has to come over, right? Because you have practitioners who've done things like karate and mm-hmm. you know uh, other martial arts. How important is the art part of martial arts for mixed martial arts? Or is it all just like a sport, train, technique. learn the technique? It goes back to the individual. Oh, it, goes, it goes back to who they are, right? As as a competitor, as a fighter, as a martial artist, if you are a martial artist, that's what you need to do. Like, that's how you need to get better is to engulf yourself in the art, mm. in martial status, in that particular way. Because if I try to, again, try to get somebody like, let's say, you guys probably don't know who this guy is, but like Mike Perry, you ever heard of him, mm-hmm. right? You get a guy like Mike Perry, who's just a fighter, 100% right? And maybe a little bit of an athlete. And you try to give him this stuff that GSP is on, he's going to shut down. I right? see. It's not going to be his style. So you're going to deter him away from him being the best that he can be, mm-hmm. right? Now, if you have somebody who is totally engulfed in that whole way of life, then yes, absolutely, because you're going to better them because that's who they are. Mm-hmm. who's the best uh striker you've ever seen in front of you in front of me yeah like who who like has anybody ever shocked you where you're like oh man i, I heard that this person was good but this is insane i mean there's a lot um we had a lot of like muay thai guys that come to the gym and like guys from phuket and like killers i don't even know their names <laughs> but those those are the guys um i mean in the UFC, I mean, right now, like even watching them in the fight, I would say Adesanya's tremendous. Mm. You know, like he's people, fun to watch. They don't really understand, like, yeah, I mean, because now he's in the limelight, but he's been killing people for years. You know, and that's, and even with again John Jones, I would say he knows how to place his shots appropriately. Dustin, the same thing. The way he, and this isn't sparring. I'm watching him too the way he can roll punches and the way he places punches effortlessly is really what you're, you're trying to look at. And then from boxing standpoint, man, I got some sleepers, man, that, that are, that are really, really good. Well, I was just going to ask you, that was a follow up to that is, you know, you got any names for us, uh, yeah. people we should watch like that, mm-hmm. you know, not everybody knows about right now. I got this kid's shirt on actually, but he is, he's a regional scene guy fights for the LFA. Um, he's really good. Um, Tyler Ray. He actually is in a lot of my Instagram videos. He kind of looks like Dustin. Everybody thinks he's Dustin, but he's not. Hmm. He's like way thicker and like bigger. He's 170 pounds. This guy is like across the board, really, really fucking good. Wrestler, good striker, super strong. Squats, uh, like for, from, like, from like a strength standpoint, like deadlifts over 400, yeah. squats over 400, you know, but he's, he's super fast. He's explosive. And he has a wrestling ped- pedigree. Um, and he's seven and one at the moment. Okay. So right. be on the lookout for him. And he's going to try to go for that n- the next Ultimate Fighter show. Oh, so, cool. cool. Oh, very cool. Like, yeah, what we got yeah. for him? What about jujitsu? What's Who's the best jujitsu guy you've ever seen? Oh, person, I man. Say. I mean, really? Uh, Antonio Carl de Zapato, uh, shoe face. He's actually really fucking good, man. Now, have you sparred with him? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> he's nah that motherfucker is crazy he's he's really really good but like he's he's beat Pushesha. he's 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 won a lot of titles but he's also in the ufc mm. so i mean from a jiu-jitsu standpoint he's definitely good um uh moicano is really good hanato moicano who fights in the ufc mm. underrated jiu-jitsu game 
I seen him actually tap out shoe face in the, in the gym. I, now are the, oh. okay. So, you know, in jujitsu, there's a lot of folklore, right? Like, uh, like for whatever reason, I've heard a lot of top level jujitsu guys say that Hicks and Gracie is actually as good as they say it is, mm -hmm. or Marcelo Garcia, where people say, yeah, good. like, uh, it's just insane. It, yeah. it, I mean, you believe that? Is it true? Do you think that Hickson is, in good, is as good as they say? I mean, at the moment, I mean, there's... I mean, he's old now, yeah, but... Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, back then, yeah, I believe yeah. so. I mean, you can't... Listen, there's some that are, like, fake, but they'll get exposed. Eventually, you'll get exposed, because mm -hmm. you're getting tested all the time. I don't want to say it because I'm not getting in trouble with the Gracies, man. Like, <laughs> they'll fucking bomb my car or something. <laughs> I'm all right. Yeah. Don't set you know, me up. <laughs> yeah. No, those are purists, man. Uh, They're purists. Good time, yeah. Phil. Dude. Yeah, good. always yeah. good. It's, it's a great time having you on the podcast, bro. Yeah, yeah, bro yeah, I appreciate it, man. Yeah. You guys got a great setup here. Yeah. Oh, thank I you. I got to tighten up on my podcast. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, we, we love what you do, man. You're thank Again, you. you're a smart guy. You, you present yourself very well. You communicate very well. Um, and you, I think we think you're doing a great job. So I yep. appreciate it, man. Thank yeah. you. Thank no you. Follow a program like MAP Suspension, which is just suspension trainers. Do it at home. Are you going to lose strength in those core lifts? You will temporarily, but I guarantee when you get back to them, you're mm -hmm. going to surpass what you did before because you're going to strengthen imbalances and weaknesses that you had that you couldn't necessarily identify because you're always doing the same stuff all the time.